was the suffering you bore for us. I thank you for being with me on this Wednesday evening. Tonight we want to look at Psalm 19. And the question I want to ask you as we do begin tonight, if I ask you who is the greatest preacher that you ever heard, what would you answer? I have heard many men that I thought were outstanding. The man that was preaching in the gospel meeting when I obeyed the gospel, I, I have always looked up to him as uh, someone that could really preach the gospel with a lot of force and a lot of inspiration. <clears throat> he would always try to inspire you to do what's right and to serve God. Uh, I look at the same man, and even now, uh, several, several years older than me, is going to Africa and converting and baptizing many people even to this day. I remember years and years ago that a sermon that always uh, stood out in my mind was when I went down to uh, Mars Hill when I was uh, at Lipscomb and heard Mid McKnight preach underneath a tent. And I just saw person after person after person go forward that night in response to the message. Uh, probably hadn't heard a message like that in a long, long time. Who is the person that would stand out in your mind? And what would make that person stand out in your mind? The fact is, the main thing that we want to think about when we think about that is not really a personality, but whether the person is delivering the truth or not. And then I'd ask you, if you stop and you think about that individual, do you really remember what they said? Or was it more about their style? Or more about their influence? Or more about the results they got? Uh, how well do you really remember those things? I suspect with most of us that there's very few sermons that really stick with us for a long time. And if you have one that really sticks out in your mind, you're very fortunate in doing that. Well, today I want to look at the 19th Psalm with you, and I want to entitle this lesson, The Two Greatest Preachers. The Two Greatest Preachers. And those two things are going to be discussed here in Psalm 19. And so I'm going to read, first of all, the first six verses, which is about the first one. And then once we talk about those, we'll look at verses 7 through 11, which discusses that second one. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from his heart. Well, what is that first great preacher? Uh, if you listen closely, you would find out it was creation. It's this world that we see around about us. As we can look out our windows and we see the grass is greening up right now. We see the springtime trees is beginning to flower and bloom. Uh, see leaves just maybe beginning to get on a few plants. It, it's amazing this beautiful world that we see around about us. You see the glory of looking out over that vast ocean. Or maybe you see the glory of looking at those snow-capped mountain peaks. God's word world is saying something to us. It starts off by saying the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. You look up at night and you see that big moon. Uh, many times as we go home from our Sunday evening services or Wednesday evening services, we're facing that big old moon, that big old full moon. Just as bright as can be, sometimes very orangish looking. It's amazing. 
it's fascinating. It's hard to imagine how far it is away. And we think about the sun, which is even much greater distance away. And we think about how that it warms this earth. It, it is amazing what God has done with this world in order to bless mankind. That sun, that moon, those stars, those things that we are talking about, they declare there is a creator. These things just did not happen. These are things for us to think about. These are things for us to uh, long to understand as best we can, but they are things to know it just did not happen. As in today's words, it, it just did not evolve. People want to say these things just evolved. These things just came to be. No, they show you that there is a design. And if there is a design, there must be a designer. They declare the vastness of God. They declare the existence of God. They declare the uniformity of God. As the psalmist is saying there, that sun comes up and then it goes down. The moon comes up and then it goes down. The moon goes through its phases. There are cycles of day after day after day. God has set laws and motions that have been going as long as this world has stood. These are some witnesses that you and I should see. And when we see these, we understand that indeed God is saying something to us. God is saying, I exist. God is saying, I care about mankind. These things are created for you and I to have the very best home that we have here on this earth. The second thing that he says about these is that day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. It is a continual cycle. It's day and then it's night. It's day and it's night. You have the months pass by. January, February, March, and April. They just keep right on going through that cycle. You have winter, then spring, then summer, then fall. You have these cycles that God has put into effect. One of the things that that is showing to us again is the faithfulness of God. And when we look at these things, these things cannot be silenced. These things are speaking. These things are saying, God has done this. They're preaching us a sermon. The third thing that he has gone to say is that there is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. You see, I can get up and I can see that sun in the morning. But I don't care where you go on this earth. They're going to see that sun. Now there are some places, North Pole, South Pole, that they might not see the sun every day. They may have uh, several days in a row of darkness before they have several days of light. But the fact is that there is a sun that's in that sky day after day after day after day. And all of these things have been planned and designed by God. So it makes no difference whether you're here and speaking English or whether you're across the ocean speaking Chinese or Vietnamese or Philippine language. It makes no difference. The Russians see the sun and the moon. The people down in Peru see the sun and the moon. The people over in Italy see the sun and the moon. The people in North Korea, yes, even they see the sun and the moon. And it is saying, I do exist. God put these things there. That is what they are saying. I want to look at Romans chapter 1. Paul will say somewhat the same thing in different words in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. The sun's preaching us a sermon. The moon's preaching us a sermon. 
The beautiful flowering trees and shrubs this time of year are preaching us a sermon. All of these things are shouting at the top of their voice or with their beauty. I am part of God's creation. These things did not just happen. And so what we are finding is that they are pointing back to God. Now what have been done? Disregard them. Yeah, I know there's a sun up there, but that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I know the moon goes through its cycles, but that doesn't mean anything. They are taking what these objects of creation are saying to us, and they are silencing them. And they are refusing to think about God. God's power and God's nature are revealed to us by the things that He has created. So that's preacher number one. And I hope that you are learning from things that you see in this world around about you. Now, what was the second one? Well, now let's read verses 7 through 11 out of Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold and much gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them your servant is warmed, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So what's the second preacher? Scriptures. The first one is creation. And creation is saying, look, there is a God. But when you stop and you think about there is a God, well, what does God want from me? What does God expect from me? Well, what's right? What's wrong? Well, you get that from the second preacher. And that second preacher is God's word. There are some things that I want to point out that it says here. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. God's word is perfect. God's word's not going to pass away. We find out the heavens and the earth will pass away, but God's word's not going to pass away. God's word is perfect just as he has given it. And there is a purpose that it says for that is to revive our soul. It is important to read it, to understand it, to know this is what God wants me to do. God's got a purpose for me. There is something God wants of me. And it's so uh, reassuring to our inner being that indeed God wants our very best and God wants us to come live with Him. Oh, how that ought to revive our soul. The second thing he says, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. I will admit there are some things difficult to understand about God's Word. That's one of the reasons why you find so many people that are arguing various different things. I think many of those arguments would go away if both parties would sit down and honestly open up the Bible and see what it says. We bring in so many preconceived ideas and we think about so many things that maybe mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, someone, husband, wife has taught us. But I think we can all agree on the fact that the scriptures are trustworthy. And they are put there for a reason to make us wise. To give us understanding. And we're not talking about that you have to have a high level of intelligence here. It can make wise those that are simple. Those that are going about their simple every day with maybe just some manual tasks that they're doing. Maybe don't have the largest amount of uh, intelligence. 
Yes, even those can find out what God's word says and simply do that and become wise. Wise in what God wants, not so much wise in the ways of this world. The third thing he says, the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. Do you ever stop to think about the fact that God's word is truth and that by following God's word, you have spared yourself of so much trouble? I hesitate to think. I do it from time to time. Where would I be if I were not a Christian? How would that have changed my life? And what I can tell you is there's no doubt in my mind that I would not have what I have today. I wouldn't have the family around that I have. I wouldn't have the church family around that I have. I wouldn't have the income that I've had down through the years if I just simply allowed myself to go wild and do whatever I want to do. That I have made the decision early in my life to follow God and and I've tried the best to do that. And what has been the result? Good things. Joy to my heart. Following God's way will bring you out the greatest amount of joy into your life. The third thing, fourth thing, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. They allow you to see. Jesus said that he was the light. God's word is described as a lamp to our feet. By knowing what God's word does say, yes, we can do exactly what he wants. We can see where we're going. In the book of Ephesians, it talks about the fact that our eyes are enlightened. In other words, when we find out what God wants, it really opens our eyes. We're no longer walking in that blindness. Next thing it says is the fear of the Lord is pure in doing forever. It is pure. It is holy. It's righteous. Telling you how to serve a holy God. And the fourth or fifth, I guess, yes, sixth thing that I find in this is that the ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. You can trust them. You can believe in them. We need to be following them. And then he talks about the value of them. They are more value than gold, pure gold, much gold. God's word should be more valuable to us than money. Is it? God's word is sweeter than honey. God's word should be our greatest pleasure. Honey would have been about the only form of what you might call candy back in that day and time. The only thing they really thought about as far as sweetness was concerned is God's word pleasurable for you. Third thing he says, there are warning. There are warning. There is a path that he expects us to travel and there's bad things that happen when we get off of that path. And the fourth thing, there is great reward in keeping them. Oh, how we think about and long for those pictures of heaven that we see discussed there in the book of Revelation. What a wonderful place that we would like to be. There's reward in keeping them. God's Word also does one other thing as you finish this psalm. It shows us what our weaknesses are. He asked the question, who can discern his errors? Well, there are many things in life that we can just somewhat do naturally that are not the right things to do. It's God's word that is that mirror that we can look into to examine our lives, to examine our souls, examine our hearts to see whether or not we're doing what God wants us to do. And then he says this, forgive my hidden faults. What's he talking about there? Well, there are times that we can do things that in reality are against God's word and not realize it. We might do it in all good conscience. We can talk about sins that we just commit unknowingly. But we'll spend time in God's word 
will understand what those are and turn from them. Or hidden faults, hidden sins, maybe just some things that we are thinking about in our heart to do or in our mind to do, maybe making plans to do, maybe not done it yet, but it's on our hearts. We're thinking about it. Impure thoughts, impure motives, bad attitudes, hidden. I know them, but no one else knows them. He's asking for forgiveness of those. Impure or other hidden faults may be like things that we have actually done and then tried to hide. You know, when Moses killed that Egyptian, he tried to bury him in the sand, though no one would know. Ananias and Sapphira got together, husband and wife, and they lied about the price that they were given to the church at that time. Thought no one else has ever gone. No, it's just the two of us in this room. Thought they had that hidden. David thought he had his sin with Bathsheba hidden, but he was found out. Achan thought nobody's got to know I stole these things. But the whole nation knew that he was a thief and he paid the price. Hidden faults. Examine ourselves and ask God to forgive our hidden sins. And then he asked, keep me away from willful sins. Give me an attitude that says, I will do what's right. Oh, I know that my mind and my heart says, this is the fun thing to do. This is the right thing to do. I'm just going to go ahead and do it anyhow. He says, keep me away from that. Give me a heart that only wants to do what God wants done. And I like how he concludes it. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I believe that's a prayer we need today. So when you look around at the world, the world's preaching to you. There is a God. And when you then look what God's word does say, you know what you're supposed to do. So the book preaches to you. Creation preaches to you. The question is, will we do what God has asked us to do? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity to study your word. Thank you for the wisdom that we find that David wrote down so long ago. And it's our prayer tonight also that you will help the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts to be pleasing to you. You are our Lord. You are our King. You're the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. You are our rock. You are our redeemer. We thank you for that. And we just want to serve you. This is pray in Jesus' name. Amen.